Thank you, Kifor, for your introduction or your explanations. And thank you, all of you who are at the other side of the screen watching us. And thank you for joining in this exciting conversation today. We are going to deal with three main topics, which are freedom of religion or belief, human rights, and also rule of law. Those are three concepts that are very much interlinked. Actually, freedom of religion or belief is a human right, an essential human right, but cannot be understood in an isolated way, it has to be understood with the rest of the human rights. And therefore, we have to see the, 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 the way that they can live together with the rest of the rights in a way that they respect uh, each other. So we can answer questions related to the limits of the of the right in a way that and does respect um, does not harm other other rights. That's very obvious in the case of the non-believers uh, rights. But I guess that we will have uh, inputs and comments from our participants. We have today six very prominent and experts in the field that I have mentioned uh, before. Um, I guess that uh, their participation will give us different perspective because they have different uh, backgrounds. So I guess that um, we will have um, the opportunity to, to confront different uh, opinions. So the, the way that we are going to conduct uh, the discussion today is by giving you some questions and giving you two rounds of interventions. I will ask you to limit your intervention between five and seven minutes. And then you will have a second round of intervention and eventually you will have the opportunity to wrap up in a final, in a final uh, intervention. We have a list, as I said before, of six speakers. Um, one of them, which is our friend Michael O'Flaherty, unfortunately is not with us physically uh, today. He's traveling abroad, so he has uh, recorded a video message, and we will deliver the, the video message uh, when he will have uh, his, his time slot. And we will start with Professor uh, Martinez Torron. Uh, Martinez Torron is professor from the University Complutense of, of Madrid in Spain. He is also a member of the Royal Academy of Jurisprudence and Legislation, Section on Law and Religion and Canon Law, in, as I said, in, in Spain. And all of you, starting with, the professor, with Professor Martin Toron, I will ask you a first question so that you can answer in this first uh, intervention, which is how can religious teachings contribute to promote human rights and enhance rule of law? Then, uh, after this first intervention, we will go for the second question. Um, but as you see, the questions are very generic, so you can mingle several thoughts and, and, and change view with your uh, colleagues if you consider that there are things that has to be commented by, by you. So, Martinez Toron, I will give you the, the floor first. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you also for having agreed to, to having me speaking first, because as you know, unfortunately, I will have to leave this interesting meeting earlier than I would like. To. Um, the um, part of what I'm going to answer refers to a document that if, uh, if, if it's possible to distribute the link to, to the people, there was a document that was with recommendation that was elaborated within the Interfaith G20 European Work Group. And uh, I think it, it may cast some light on many of the issues we are going to discuss here this evening. Uh, it was... It was a group work, a teamwork, and I am particularly indebted to Professor Jonatas Machado from the University of Coimbra in Portugal and Professor Maria Jose Valero from Villanueva University in Madrid. So responding to, to your question about the, um, how religious teaching can contribute, I think that the first perhaps departure point is um, it to to depart from the assumption that uh, social cohesion and social harmony must rely on the significance of religious and belief identity for the lives of many people. So very often we treat, uh, or we refer even in judicial, in judicial environments, to freedom of religion or belief or to religion or belief is just a matter of choice. 
is, it is, of course, a matter of choice when we face it from a legal perspective. For, from, for people, it happens the same with sexual orientation. For people, for the, for the people that live it, it's not just a matter of free choice in the traditional sense. It's something that defines themselves and sometimes very deeply. So um, in order to understand uh, um, freedom of religion, the human right to freedom of religion or belief, its intrinsic meaning, we have to understand that it plays a very, very important role in the lives of many individuals and also of many groups around the world. And what I say about religion, I say exactly the same about any non-religious beliefs, because uh, at the end of the day, what matters is the this self-definition of what we may call the... Um, the moral dimension or the ethical dimension of the person, which is something that is essential for living together. So how can religious teaching cooperate in this area of, uh, of social harmony and uh, of mutual respect? I would say departing from this seriousness of what religion or belief means for many people and groups, and also uh, understanding uh, on the part especially of religious leaders and also on the part of state officials or educators involved in, in religious education, understanding that the very important difference between uh, respecting the beliefs of other people and respecting that other people have the right to have different beliefs, even if they have beliefs uh, with, whom, with which you disagree profoundly. So it's possible to make perfectly compatible the idea that you have very firm convictions, religious or non-religious, about uh, who you are, um, how is the universe, is there a God, how this God is, etc., etc. Uh, you may have your own uh, firm, very firm beliefs, and at the same time this is compatible with respecting the opposite views of many other people. Not because you have to respect their beliefs per se, you respect the people that hold those beliefs, which is a very different thing. And uh, once we understand that, it is possible to begin to, to, to speak about mutual respect, because respect comes from the people, not necessarily for the ideas. Honestly, I found the ideas of many people, uh, sometimes the ideas of my own, uh, uh, silly or impossible to understand, or irrational, or even despicable doesn't matter. The, the, the problem is to enter into a dialogue with people with different ideas and to try to find common ground between very opposite views of the universe. And that, my experience tells me that this is always possible when there is good faith on both sides of the dialogue, uh, when there are no hidden agendas, uh, that uh, I just uh, pretend to have a dialogue with other people, but at the end of the day, what really matters to me is to be declared the winner of the contest. If we go through, to, through that itinerary, probably the results are not going to be very positive. And uh, then any religious teaching, mat, um, uh, they may assume the, the, the truth of some beliefs. For instance, when you are engaged in religious education in a religious environment, which is very different from religious education in a state environment or in a state educational centers. But in both cases, the education about the beliefs of other people must be permeated by respect for those other people, even, I insist, if you disagree with their ideas. I think you have to, to unmute your micro, Alvaro. Can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me now? So, can you hear me now? Please talk now. Yes, we hear, we hear well. Great. So, thank you, for Professor, for your intervention, and th thank you for flagging 
that uh, idea that the starting point should be the respect of the person and therefore after the respect of the person we will be able to to understand and to respect the ideas and the different beliefs and so on and so forth but the starting point is the respect of the person which is a, a broader uh, concept that will involve uh, other elements uh, in terms of the respect of, of the difference of of, of, the, of the group or the beliefs or the non-beliefs and so on and so forth. So thank you for your intervention. We have as a second speaker, Elisabetta Kitanovic, Dr. Elisabetta Kitanovic. She's the Executive Secretary for Human Rights at the Conference of European Churches. It's a very reputed uh, professor and collaborator with uh, many organizations and Professor, uh, Professor Kitanovic, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, and good evening from Brussels from the Conference of European Churches. Uh, the Conference of European Churches has been working on human rights since it exists as a human rights agenda. It is very linked to the peace-building processes on the European continent. And I will offer you the answers based on our experience here uh, in the House. Um, of the organization, which is fellowship of around 114 churches from 40 European countries. Our organization uh, has human rights portfolio, which is based on two pillars. First pillar is advocacy and monitoring of human rights developments on the international legal level. And the second pillar is human rights education. If a faith-based organization wishes to work on the promotion of human rights, it would be very important to find the existing links between theology and human rights law. It goes without saying that uh, from point of view of churches and religious communities, there is no always moral agreement or consensus on human rights agenda. Therefore, it is important that uh, before we start to promote human rights, we have consensus on the respect of universality of human rights. We all need to know that human rights are interdependent and interrelated. There is no hierarchy of rights. Whoever works on human rights should not make competition also among rights, but really embrace the concept of universality of human rights. It is also very much important, I would believe, for the FBOs to become increasingly aware of the document of the UN Charter, which says the following. We, the people of the United Nations, are determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from the tra uh, treaties and other sources of the international law can be maintained and promote social progress and better uh, standards of life in larger freedom. Briefly, it means that everybody is responsible for the pro promotion and protection of human rights. And it is, of course, after the faith-based organizations that should also embrace this responsibility. Working on human rights uh, comprehends uh, a need to know them and working in the area of human rights education, I believe it is really excellent way uh, to move forward and to give great contribution to the promotion and protection of human rights, also from the side of the faith-based organizations. The issue is that many faith communities work on human rights without really talking or using international legal language. Learning and teaching human rights education is a way forward and uh, it is one way that we can contribute also to its constant developments. Now, on the question that Your Excellency have mentioned, how can religious teaching contribute to promotion of human rights? I would uh, take one of the examples, and I believe we very strongly, as faith-based com communities, we can give our contribution to combating hate speech and hate crime. Combating the hate speech based on religious grounds and the relations between a growing lack of respect of other people in communications, especially in social media, and the rise of political populism on a global scale is one of the tasks for the churches and religious communities. As uh, FBOs, we are committed to truth love. From the side of the European churches, we could see that there is the commitment to stand up for the fundamental right to freedom of expression 
and to stand up at the same time against hate speech. We could see that FBOs called many times in the last years upon all relevant actors, Kaitzid included, in society to engage in the public discourse and debate in a way that underlines our common humanity and enhance the human, uh, human dignity of every individual. The FBOs emphasized the need for informed and fact-based dialogue, reflecting in the search for adequate solutions, the complexity of the political and other issues. In this regard, Conference of European Churches has a long-standing program, which is called Summer School on Human Rights, where um, in 2019, speakers and participants of this program expressed their concern that the populists encourage the use of hate speech to steer one group against another, to attain a relevant amount of votes rather than contribute to societal peace and political compromise. Xenophobic attitudes, stigmatization of minorities, stereotyping based on race, color, national and ethnic origin, religion or disability, gender or sexual orientation led to hatred and can ultimately result in violence. Antisemitism, Islamophobia and Christianophobia are expressions of such attitudes, but they are not limited to religious groups, but also affect others, such as refugees, uh, migrants, asylum seekers, in general, uh, or Roma people and minority groups. While freedom of expression is an important right and includes the right to disagree or to express dislike, the way we speak about other people has both moral and legal limits. So I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kitanovic, for your intervention. And thank you also for raising that important question, which is the linkage between the respect of human rights and the fight against uh, hate speech. That is the rationale behind the action plan that the UN Secretary General has launched recently at the UN level uh, about uh, the prevention, of, sorry, the, com the combat of, of hate speech. And the rationale is the same, is the linkage uh, with uh, human rights. Now we will go to Mr. Claudio Eppelman. He's executive director of the Latin American Jewish Congress. He's a good friend and respected uh, speaker in many fora about the things that we are dealing with uh, today. He's a good friend of us, Claudio Eppelman. Unfortunately, we cannot speak in our mother tongue today, so we will have to speak. We have to speak in in English, and and I will give you the floor. La palabra es suya, señor Pelman. Muchas gracias, Álvaro. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, Ambassador Álvaro. Um, I would love to to be uh, the, to be in Saudi Arabia doing this panel. Unfortunately, it is impossible, but. Uh, uh, I think uh, would be also prove the working all together uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, all the religions leaders, all the interface community, as a proof of the uh, of the topic of uh, this conference. But I believe that soon, uh, the, the, with the hope of the soon, we can do it when the sanitary conditions will allow us to to do it together. So about the about the topic. And uh, uh, following the intervention of my distinguished colleagues, uh, I'd like to remark about the, as it pre was presented in the very beginning about uh, Ambassador Albarcete, about the freedom of uh, religion and the uh, identity. I believe that the person, it is an individual right to define the, the religion. And religion is an individual decision and a personal decision. And uh, Confronting the uh, the choose of electing the um, professing the religion that you want is also attacking the freedom of religion. So attacking the freedom of religion, I think, or banning, limiting uh, the the freedom of religions is attacking the personal identity of the believers. Because if you define that the religion is part of yourself, of your own identity, and you have an a limitation about how you can uh, profess your religion, so you have a limitation in your in your identity. And so, I believe that we have to fight for keeping this right 
in the highest level. But the question is, once I decide to be a Jew, because I, uh, I am a proud Jew, that uh, my tradition marks us to live in communities. So we, we, it is a, to, to be a Jew is not only an individual decision, it is a collective decision to live in community in a frame with others. And we have the mandate of uh, trying to improve the state of the world. So it is also not the community is isolated. The community has a, a lot of interactions with the general society where in the countries we live. So if we are demanding the, the right to, to, to ensure, to secure our uh, religion, so the question is, what about the right of the others? And that is the key question for the Jewish leadership, for the Jewish tradition. So if we only believe that we have right to, to, to profess our own, religion, but not the others, we are facing a problem. And this is the point that how we teach, how we see, how our tradition explain the diversity of religions. And once we are defending our right, how we have to do with the rights of the others. This is, I think, the key questions in order to create and to defend the human rights. Because when we speak about human rights, as, a, um, as we have heard a couple of minutes ago, about the universality of the human rights, it is not a personal, it is not for each one of us in our own capability. It is universal. So this is the key point for me in order to understand that uh, human rights means to protect the rights of all the traditions, the, all the minorities and the, all of the majorities, because it has a sense of uh, universality. And in this uh, capability, I would, I would dream and I work for that, that uh, when there is, a, as was mentioned, when there is an attack against one religion, when there is a limitation against uh, one religion, if there is an attack against a mosque, all Christians and Jews together have to, to be leading the fight against Islamophobia. And if there is an attack against the Christianity, all Muslims and Jews together have to be fighting against this uh, for the freedom of the Christianity. And the same things so you dream that it, if there is an attack against uh, a synagogue or a Jewish community, so the Christians and Muslims would be leading. And this is interacting, and this is the way I think and I believe that we have to spread the idea that our right must be reflected in the other. And this is the way to create a society where pluralism and diversity are built in the frame of coexistence. In this, in this point, I think all the religions, all the traditions, the religions <coughs> have a key role, not only explaining about ourselves, but also about the other. And this is the, the point that I think I would like to remark again in my first intervention. Thank you, Ambassador. Peppelman, for your intervention, and thank you for sharing with us your, the, the Jewish angle to human rights and for connecting that with that idea of the universality of, of human rights and um, and, and the, the reaction that all um, religions should have when, whenever there is any attack to any religion, regardless uh, if that religion coincides with your beliefs or not, but in a way they are all being attacked to something which is connected to a universal value, which is the freedom of uh, belief, freedom of religion. Thank you, Mr. Claudio Eppelman. Then we, we go to Professor Susana Mancini. Um, Professor Mancini um, works at the Department of Legal Studies at the University of Bologna in Italy. 
So, Professor Mancini, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador. I am so, and, and hello to everybody. I'm sorry that I uh, had some technical issues, so I just joined here. So, um, I am not sure exactly if you were like asking the same questions to all panelists as I missed the first minutes. Or I do, I do. I was, I was making the first question to all of you, but I can repeat it for, for you. How can religious teachings contribute to promote human rights and enhance rule of law? That is a first round, and then we will have another round where we, you will have the opportunity to answer the second, the second question. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and apologies for, again for uh, for my no, technical issues here. So um, this is such a fascinating question, and um, I definitely think that religious teaching can contribute to the promotion of human rights and to democratic values in general, but because I believe that there is a convergence among religious and non-religious views that testify to a, like a, a shared commitment right, to protecting and defending human rights. The, the delicate point here is, however, who has the authority to decide over the content of religious teaching? Because if the aim is to sustain the culture of human rights, one has to remember that human rights are a, a, a truly revolutionary discourse. Human rights aim to change traditionally entrenched behaviors and traditionally entrenched like ways of thinking, so they are counter-majoritarian, they are counter-cultural. And this is true in particular if one thinks about the human rights of traditionally subordinated groups, such as children or women, sexual minorities, etc. Because most cultures are typically patriarchal, the rights of such groups, of course, are counter-cultural. So... A key issue, I think, in this light is that if religions are committed to human rights, to sustaining a culture of human rights, they should pay attention to minoritarian voices. Because, let's put it this way, if human experience is at the basis of all theology, well, then theology should reflect a plurality of experiences. Whereas throughout history, such experience has been identified mainly and defined mainly by men. So I feel very strongly that women theologians should become like protagonists of religious teaching because women theologians have shown that by ex exposing that traditional theology is biased and male-centered, they, you know, you can bring back to the center of the debate the ethical egalitarian voice of religion, which is fully consistent with human rights discourses. The interesting thing with women theologians is that they tend to, at least, I'm generalizing here, but I would say that as a starting point, women theologians adhere to an egalitarian anthropology. They point to the necessity to overcome all forms of oppression in an inclusive society. So I think that religious teaching should focus on the theology of the other, so to say, on the perception of diversity, which is, you know, gender diversity, religious diversity. And therefore, uh, this is, I think, this is the way to find the point of convergence, like with secular views that are also based on the uh, universal, like, value of human dignity. So I think and I can stop here and uh, I'll be happy to jump back into the conversation later. Thank you, Professor. And with your comments, I think that you have complemented the interventions of the previous speakers by adding that uh, idea of the convergence uh, between believers and non-believers and also the respect to minorities and you have mentioned and the, the 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 group i mean the the role of uh, women and 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 the idea to respect and uh, diversity which is something that from other angles has been treated by other speakers as well but and uh, definitely your intervention adds uh, more elements to the to the discussion or to the conversation today so thank you professor for your intervention then we have the intervention of um Professor Michael O'Flaherty. Professor Michael O'Flaherty is director of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, which is based here in, in Vienna. Unfortunately, Professor uh, Michael O'Flaherty is traveling today, he's traveling abroad, so he's not in, in Vienna, he's traveling to, 
to Greece. And uh, he has left a video message recorded and I kindly ask my colleagues if they can project the video message of Mr. O'Flaherty. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel. And I do apologize that I'm doing so by means of a recorded message. I very much like the theme that you've chosen for these discussions. It's clear to me that we cannot have steady, sturdy rule of law without respect for human rights. Within the canon of human rights, very importantly and co-equally, is freedom of religion or belief. And so therefore it's axiomatic that we cannot have strong rule of law without deep respect for the freedom of religion or belief. This is a topic we at the Fundamental Rights Agency work on in a number of different uh, contexts and directions. Most importantly for our discussions today, I would suggest in the context of our surveys of the experience of minority groups within the European Union, including minority groups that in some contexts are defined by religious affiliation. The figures are quite disturbing for certain groups. Take, for example, the situation of people who self-identify as Jewish in Europe. We're worried. We see patterns of harassment and discrimination uh, which are growing worse in some places. We see a society that does not have sufficient confidence in the state to complain about its situation. In fact, being harassed, being discriminated against has become almost normalized uh, for some people in the Jewish communities. And we in general see inadequate efforts by the state in some European countries to protect and to cherish its Jewish community. Things are so worrying that when we ask members of the Jewish community if they have ever considered emigrating from Europe, a growing number say that that indeed is the case. And that number rises the younger uh, the Jewish community members with whom we speak. And frankly, my friends, if Europe loses its Jewish community, then something dreadful will have happened at the heart of the modern European project constructed on lessons learned from our past. Let me turn then to the Muslim community. Here again, we see worrying patterns of alienation, discrimination, even acts of violence, as well, of course, as a severe underreporting of these incidents to the authorities. Just a few months ago, we were able to add additional evidence regarding the experience of people who self-identify as Muslim within our societies. This time, we asked the general population, when broadly surveying them around their attitudes to human rights, we asked them particular questions. Here are the questions and the answers. In the first place, how many of the general population in our survey would welcome a Muslim person as a neighbor? 22% said they would not. How many would welcome a member of the Muslim faith into their family through marriage? 31% said no. And 21% of those questioned said it was okay not to hire a woman because she was wearing a headscarf. Now, the situation of the Muslim and the Jewish communities in Europe, while worrying in general, has become even more acute in the context of COVID-19, where, as you know, there have been preposterous uh, claims made, particularly on social media, regarding their role in, in, in propagating the virus. Data such as those that I've just shared with you, my friends, uh, illustrate the need for all of us to invest deeply in building uh, respectful, diverse societies in which all of our members are treated equally uh, and with dignity. In this context, I greatly welcome a number of current and upcoming initiatives of the European Union, in particular action plans of the European Commission, which I think are likely to make a profound positive impact. Now, going forward, I hope you'll allow me to broaden the issue ever so slightly, to focus not so much on respecting freedom of religion or belief, but rather giving religious voices a more respectful space in the broad discussions of how we promote and protect human rights, uh, in my context, of course, within the European Union. I'm glad that this topic is getting increasing attention. 
I know that it's one that you look like and that the interfaith dialogues engage on from time to time, and this is greatly to be welcomed. The Fundamental Rights Agency plays its own modest part in these discussions. We have conducted and facilitated a number of discussions in recent years on this topic, and repeatedly there are two foundational learnings which emerge. The first is that we have to invest in spaces to dialogue. We need formally to create the environments where we can have the necessary exchange of views. And perhaps most primordially of all, within those dialogue spaces, we need to learn more about each other. We need to develop literacy about each other. The human rights community needs to develop a religious literacy. The faith communities perhaps could do more to develop a literacy around the formal structures of human rights protection. And again, coming back to our panel today, I think this is exactly such a space uh, to have such necessary conversations. And I wish you very well for the proceedings. Thank you. Professor O'Flaherty, congratulations because you have been renewed as head of the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. But above all, congratulations for the good work that you are doing as head of that important organization of the European Union. You have flagged a very important aspect of the European Union construction, which is the respect of minorities by saying that Europe won't be Europe if we Europeans, we don't respect minorities. And then you have used some statistics to speak about the Jewish uh, discrimination and the Muslim discrimination in our continent. And you have advocated for the establishment of the spaces for dialogue. And there where we find a common ground as, as an organization with the mandate of promoting intercultural and interreligious dialogue I'm sure that you will understand that we, we follow your recommendations very, very, um, in a, from a very uh, close uh, point of view. So that is the intervention, that was the intervention of Professor Michael O'Flaherty. And then as the last speaker in this first round, we have Dr. Abdi Zibene. I'm not sure if I have pronounced it correctly, and I apologize for that. But he's senior advisor to the minister at the, at the Ministry of Peace in Ethiopia. Professor Dr. Sibini, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Excellency. And this is a fantastic panel. I think everybody has mentioned a very important point, and this is a quite interesting dialogue. Uh, and you have also pronounced my name perfectly. And thank you for that, Mr. Uh, Dan. This uh, Ministry of Peace is a government ministry, uh, and it is the first of its kind. Uh, and Ethiopia, as you know, is a secular state. Uh, I think the uh, topic of discussion on this round is quite interesting. And the issues raised are highly interconnected, religion, human rights, and rule of law. And whichever way we put them, there is high level of uh, reciprocity among these important uh, values to ensure the betterment of humanity at large. So through teaching of human rights, we can achieve a better religious right. And through ensuring the rule of law, we can also guarantee human rights and uh, religious rights. But in this regard, the importance of religious teaching to promote human rights is quite crucial. And in this regard, I would like to put three uh, points. One, uh, religion as one dimension of culture lays uh, a foundation for human rights. Uh, rather than thinking human rights as a separate body of knowledge or practice addressed by seemingly modern uh, and independent institutions like civil society or legal institutions, religion has that power uh, uh, in our society of nurturing and cultivating and promoting human rights. And this is very important in many regards. And this helps the conceptualization as well as the practice of human rights anchored in spiritual and belief systems. This is a very important element for us. And secondly, uh, religion via its sense of community also contributes the enhancement of rule of law 
in taming or transforming the individual. And this will play a very important role in nurturing a sick behavior across the populace at large. And the member of a community, unlike the individual, without such membership is likely to have the tendency to have a reasonable degree of shame and fear that would potentially prevent them from breaking laws in general and from infringing human rights in particular. So there is a huge connection between uh, a belief and respect to the law. And the third one is religion can be a foundation of rule of law via the production of legal text uh, in, a, in a minimalist manner. Uh, from our experience, you know, Ethiopia is one of uh, ancient nations and we used to have very old texts, religious texts, that serve as a base for the law. And so there is a huge connection between the rule of law and sometimes also uh, where the law is extracted have huge connection from religious texts and teachings. So these are a very crucial elements. One example in Ethiopian case is the Fitah Negust or Law of Kings, first written in Arabic and used quite extensively for uh, a long period of time in Ethiopian history as the source of law. But uh, in our case, you know, we have large population here in Ethiopia and in our also neighborhood in the Horn of Africa, uh, a large number of the populace subscribe to uh, religion, 98, 97%. So religion is quite crucial. And through the teaching of religion, we uh, aim to enhance and promote human rights uh, as well as the rule of law. So this is an, a very important topic, and I think I'll wrap up on this. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, and thank you for bringing the voice from, from Africa. We heard from Latin America, we heard from Europe, and now through you we have heard from, from Africa. You have highlighted the linkage between human rights and spiritual convictions, and therefore the connection between the, the beliefs and the respect of, of the law, and that's something that is essential in the in the understanding of the connections or the relations between religion and, 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 and law. So with your remarks, we have concluded the first round of intervention. As you know, there is a, now a second round of intervention, but you have heard from your colleagues certain comments and, and remarks, so feel free to, to, to jump into the conversation and... Uh, and, and make your own comments or your own reflections. Still, as you know, we have a second question for this second round of interventions, which is how can law protect religious values and beliefs, as well as religious diversity and pluralism? I think that some of you has already referred to those questions, but uh, I will give you the floor just in case you want to deepen on, on, on that issue, so again, if, if you consider that you have comments about the remarks of your colleagues, feel free to make those, those comments. We will follow the same order as before, so first I will give the floor to Professor Martinez Torron. Yeah, thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm very glad you asked this question, um, because very often uh, we talk in these type of meetings about interreligious dialogue, dialogue between uh, religious believers, non-religious believers, uh, that Susana Mancini was referring to, etc. And um, I think this is very nice, and we have to do it, and we have to establish the institutional channels of cooperation between the state or society and religious community. But the fact is, even if they are a minority, there are a significant number of people in this planet that engage in violent and in intolerant behavior, and even proclaiming ideas or alleged beliefs that would justify those actions. And now they think this is the role of lawyers. We lawyers, part of our job is, is not very nice and consists uh, in uh, figuring out the worst possible problems so that we can anticipate those problems and we can figure out uh, ways to prevent those type of conflicts, or if we couldn't prevent them, at least to solve them in a rapid and efficient manner. Now, uh, what do we do about this intolerant behavior of other people, which is they claim, those people, that is justified 
or, or is founded on a particular belief, religious or non-religious. And I would say here the, the reaction of the law can be very different. One way I, I already mentioned that can be anticipating the problem, trying to prevent the problem, different things, reacting to the problem, trying to, to solve it exposed. I'm going to refer mostly to the uh, ex ante part of the of the, the um, legal reaction. And I would um, uh, emphasize here on that uh, the responsibility both of the state officials, the civil society in general, and in particular of religious leaders to take a very, a very proactive attitude in this area. First, uh, by uh, emphasizing through education, we, we talked about that before, emphasizing like the positive aspects of uh, freedom of religion or belief. And I remind is when we talked about religious education in the, in the first round, uh, we should not understand it exclusively as education about religions or beliefs, also about the right, the human right to freedom of religion or belief, that surprisingly lots of people in this planet don't have in the slightest idea about what it means in practice. So it has to be uh, taught. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, in addition to this positive role of religious leaders, uh, I put emphasize the, the need of cooperation of religious leaders with the state authorities in, uh, in counteracting the violent or intolerant behavior of other people. Uh, and I'm thinking of uh, hate crimes and uh, in particular hate speech. So uh, but allow me to be very clear on that. When people engage in hate speech, and they claim it's a justification for that hate speech of other types of hate crimes or intolerant behavior. They claim to be based on a particular belief or on a particular religion. The relevant religious leaders or non-religious leaders, comparable leaders, they have to speak out. They have this responsibility. It's an uncomfortable role, but it's the only way to deal with that. They have the, the responsibility to discredit those people that they are not acting in the name of uh, Islam, say, or of uh, Christianity, of whatever they want to be uh, claiming, acting. But uh, no, that's what I have to say. And you know, Spaniards, we talk a lot, and I have to stop here. And, uh, and I apologize once again for having to leave earlier than I, I would like to. But uh, thanks for your patience and for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Just before you leave, I have a question for you. You, you said that they have to speak out. I guess that you, 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 you refer to religious leaders, but religious leaders of those religions who have been manipulated to justify violence, or you mean also religious leaders from other affiliations so that they can uh, support the idea that religion you know, is, is, is manipulated. Yeah, that, 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 yeah that, that's a very pertinent question. And I would say both. Everybody, religious or non-religious, we all have, from each of one, from our respective roles in society, we have the responsibility to to, to, to tailor the reins of the problem, not to just to, to watch it from the, from the palco, as we say in Spanish, from the from the theater, from the comfortable chair on the theater. No, we have to, to go to the stage and to do something about that. And of course, leaders of other religions have also a responsibility, but the main responsibility of the leaders of that particular religions, because they have more credibility to be speaking on behalf of that religion, not the other extremist people that commit certain crimes alleging this or that other particular belief. That was what I had in mind. But thank you. For thank you, for Professor. I'm sure, I'm sure that you acknowledge the, the, that that's very difficult to, to, to pass the message to the media because the news is not the statement of the religious leader, but the attack. And uh, it's hard for the religious leaders sometimes to to pass the message uh, to the to the media. I, I know. I remember when the, no, I, I remember when, when some um, uh, awful crimes were committed in the name of in the false name of Islam in Spain. Uh, I remember talking to some of the one of the main leaders in Spain. Unfortunately, 
he died uh, a few months ago due to coronavirus. And uh, he was telling me, uh, when I asked him, why don't you speak out more frequently in the media? I mean, we try to do, but the media do not pay attention to us. They are interested in the, in the other side of the conflict. They don't want to present the, the positive side of Islam. And I thought, uh, you are right, that's a very difficult role and it's very necessary. Yeah, I guess that you refer to Iman Tatari. He is really a, a, a prominent figure in, in Spain. Yeah. He was the That's president it. of the Islamic community in, yeah. in our country, and we are we are missing him already. He is one yeah. of the victims of the COVID-19 in, in our country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for your intervention. Thanks to you all, and I apologize for leaving. Please, don't mention. Thank you. So thank you. After the intervention of, of Professor Martinez Torron, I will pass the floor to uh, Dr. Elisabetta Kitanovic. Doctor, you are muted. Now. Apologies for that. <laughs> thank you, Your Excellency, for these questions. And uh, thank you so much to Professor Torron for uh, this explanation previously. Uh, we have witnessed actually that uh, the international legal systems cover very well uh, in the certain number of articles in the international legal um, instruments the protection of freedom of religion or belief. But uh, what it's lacking on the international level, and maybe we can discuss that maybe in some of the occasion, is main, mainly that uh, we are lacking the UN Convention on Freedom of Religion or Belief or the UN Convention on the Protection of the Rights of Religious Minorities. Such a document, um, maybe it would help um, enlightening also the states in a certain way how to deal with this issue, which is very complex. And it really depends from the rule of law in the country, the way that minorities are going to be treated, as well as uh, the state of the and the level of democracy in the certain country. Uh, maybe it would be good that uh, as we, the purpose of the G20 Interfaith Forum is to recommend uh, actually policy or and to create policy recommendations to maybe uh, for the next uh, G20 Interfaith Forum, we open up this question and maybe that could be valuable contribution of G20 in general um, in helping solving this issue and exploring what would be the possibilities for having such a document on the global level. Maybe it would be good also to, um, uh, to discuss um, uh, this issue of religious minorities uh, tete -a -tete, for example, at the Conference of European Churches, we have created a platform on human rights education that I have mentioned previously. And we have summer school on human rights education where we are discussing uh, issues like anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We always invite people from these communities to speak about their own uh, issues, about the way uh, and the violence that they are facing. Uh, about the ways, uh, for example, that, that they are looking for um, solidarity and common advocacy on these issues. Because communities who are um, attacked, uh, just um, advocating for themselves, uh, it is not an easy task. I think what is lacking is also global solidarity and interfaith solidarity that communities uh, start defending each other and stand for each other in the public sphere. Uh, when there is violence against certain religious communities or a uh, violation of uh, fundamental human rights. So as Conference of European Churches, we are particularly uh, interested in this question of the rights of religious minorities because majority of the CAC constituency are actually minority churches. And uh, the broad scope of the conference constituency uh, have discussed this issue uh, in the book Religious Diversity in Europe and the Rights of Religious Minorities. And uh, we have uh, addressed this um, issue, um, adding to this debate, which is based on practical experience, political advocacy, and also academic reflection. Uh, minority religious communities uh, face many challenges in Europe 
And also Michael O'Ferty was referring to this. What does that mean from the surveys that fundamental rights agency have been conducting in past decade on this issue? And I think uh, we need to underline that they, uh, still religious communities do struggle with attaining an appropriate legal status. Others are subject to discrimination, uh, um, then exclusion, or even open hostility against individual members and the entire community. As uh, Claudio mentioned, and also Professor uh, Theron, um, and we heard the same issue from the colleague of, uh, from Ethiopia. Um, complaints range from widespread prejudices to destruction or even demolition or confiscation of property obstructions to religious rituals and uh, ceremonies to the need of the protection by police or even military. In cases where there is a strong historic bond between state and society and a specific religion, minorities can at time also be regarded as dissenters and therefore disloyal citizens. And this is a big problem. While Conference of European Churches is convinced that minorities bring an added value to societies, sometimes we have the issues that the government do not see that, but treat these religious minorities as a threat, unfortunately, to the national security, which was mentioned previously. Quite often, religious literacy that Professor Susanna mentioned, its importance and the female theologians discussing and participating and contributing to shaping the language and the narrative. We believe uh, that uh, it is, uh, there is more space to be developed deeper and to be de developed on another level and more work needs to be done also uh, in understanding uh, each other, understanding the needs of uh, various communities and uh, not staying just in our own box, but actually helping to uh, our neighbors. Because from the Christian point of view, we have this fantastic commandment, which is says, love your neighbor. And our neighbor can be also and is actually uh, and Muslim and Jew and Roma person and divorced parent and person with sexual orientation and person of a different um, uh, gender and age and disabled person and so on. So our neighbor can be anyone. And of course, if we also, from the side of the religious communities, we, we practice this law. And of course, uh, at the same time, uh, as theologian, I, I, I would like to say that practicing these values, it's not an easy task. It is really, uh, everyday effort and exercise that each of us needs to make an effort to witness. But of course, uh, with the goodwill uh, and um, with good faith, I think that really religious communities can make uh, a change and uh, can be a game changer and contributing in eradicating hate speech and hate crime uh, in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kitanovic. Yeah, that's our challenge every day, the daily task to respect differences and, and to, embra to embrace the other, regardless their religious or political or ethnic uh, difference. Um, you have made a, a concrete uh, suggestion in terms of recommendation. Maybe you can frame it, try to frame it uh, again uh, in a in a more, um, let's say, um, understandable way for for us. Yes, I mean. So that um, we can take notes. Yes, I, I I'll come back to that. Uh, that is actually not an easy recommendation, just to say, and it's very pity that Professor Teron is not here because it would be very interesting from legal point of view. Uh, to, to hear this opinion, but uh, I see that Professor Susanna, it's also from the Legal Studies Department of University of Bologna, so maybe she could also comment uh, on, on, on this question. Actually, on the international level, there is a lack of the United Nations Convention on Freedom of Religion or Belief. There is a lack, it does not exist. And then I have a question. I mean, um, I was asking myself, um, why it does not exist? And of course, then the first question on uh, the first answer comes 
well, that would be very difficult to draft. It, it is, uh, I think, difficult uh, work. And I see Professor Susanna, it's uh, noting. So uh, I would like really to hear your opinion on that. And then another difficult issue uh, that I think it would be worth discussing, and this is if, if we would have also UN Convention on the rights of religious minorities, not in general on minorities, but on the rights of religious minorities, or this uh, maybe there could be one UN Convention which would regulate actually both uh, issues uh, uh, at this point. Of course, before we run to the policy, a recommendation uh, as G20, one would really need to organize a very thoroughly debate uh, on this issue. But Dr. Dr. Kidanovic, do you think we should have regional legal instruments about the same topics that the United Nations has produced uh, already, since they are universal um, values and universal uh, objectives? Um, yes, it, it can be, but of course, if it exists on the UN level, of course, it can be adapted also on the regional level. But maybe it would be interesting to have this uh, debate and to look how this can be done. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mr. Eppelman. Do you have uh, comments or remarks on, on these questions? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, um, my colleague uh, just said uh, in the first intervention that there is a different uh, difference language between the religious approach and the legal legal approach to to this topic, and I, and I want I want to to go a little bit deeper in this point. And I say that if we recognize and we accept and we agree that diversity and pluralism in the society is a positive value. The question is, how do we protect it? What we, sh have, what we should do in order to keep it and to, and to protect from the uh, extremist attacks against it? So, during the Second World War, there was a project, the Nazi project, that was to exterminate a minority in Europe. So, we know about the atrocities that the Nazis made with the Jews in Europe. And I think this is the learning we have to, to try to, to put in the universal language. And after what we saw in Auschwitz, the extermination uh, camps, and uh, uh, I think we have to learn something. And uh, I think when the world so understood the, what happened in Europe during the Second World War, the issue of the human rights came up and was put it in the higher uh, level of discussion. And uh, one of the promoters uh, was uh, uh, René Cassin, who drafted the first, uh, the, the first uh, declaration of human rights, he was a, from a Jewish family. He used to say that, he said that he only had to translate the Ten Commandments in the new in modern language. And this is it was his uh, remark about the Human Rights uh, Universal Declaration. And what is the meaning of this, uh, this uh, sentence? I, I will try to, to go into it. And try to remark that uh, if we put a candle in the darkness, we can say that it is a point of reference and it is clearly uh, what should be done is it is a moral commandment it is the protection of the individuals and the human the rights of individuals and the human uh, rights human person human being so what is the point and this is i think the role of the law and the universal law if a country if a society if a government wants to attack a minority, the law must be the instrument to protect the minority. If not, we can repeat our uh, we can repeat this story. And how to prevent what we are, what already happened and we are learning is the question to the law. So 
we have here the need of some laws and also some international laws to protect minorities. And I think that this is the value of the Universal Declaration, the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that it is a candle that marked the, the, the path where the law must be protecting in the national level the minorities, the person, the, 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 not only the minority, the, also the individual the rights. And I think this is something that we have to learn and we have to also, as has been said, to prevent, to repeat it. And this is a, a point that I believe that is a, a relevant uh, instrument. Because if not, we're going to, to see uh, how, can be make, uh, how, how can be made a decision of a government also to attack or to do not defend the freedom of the minorities. This is, uh, for me, the, 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 the point about the... Because I explained in my first intervention what can the religious teachers, the, the religious leaders, can put as an insight in this topic. Now I think this is the, the, the insight of the law and the human rights, the recognition of the human rights as universals, and as an instrument to protect these values, if again we accept about diversity and pluralism as a value in our countries and societies. Thank you, Mr. Eppelman. I have to recall that you have been a very active a member of the Latin America Committee of this G20 Interfaith Forum. You have been very active in all the preparatory works in that specific region, and maybe you, we can hear from you in your next uh, intervention about uh, Latin America and, and some specific uh, uh, peculiarities in Latin America about uh, religion, major, major, uh, majorities, minorities, and that um, dynamic of, uh, of uh, different uh, religions in the, in the continent. Thank you, Mr. Eppelman. And now the floor is to uh, Professor Susana Mancini. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you to, to all of you because these interventions are, are really on, uh, on this. I mean, you've really like, pointed to all of the relevant problems here. Well, as an answer to the question that uh, uh, my colleague Elizabeth posed concerning the uh, role of law and specifically international law in protecting religion, well, this is a huge, uh, there's a huge debate around here. Just the European Court of Human Rights that operates in a certainly not homogeneous, but at least in, in the context of the Council of Europe, which is very diverse, but not as diverse as the whole world, has a lot of difficulties in deciding religious freedom cases. And uh, it is very criticized because in its approach, very often it ends up by using a doctrine which the court has called the doctrine of the margin of appreciation, which simply means that the state parties to the to the Council of Europe are by and left, uh, by and, and, and large left with a very high level of discretion in deciding cases related to religious freedom. As a constitutional law person, um, um, you, I, can, I can very quickly um, give you a, 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 like a, a general frame of the diff different models through which um, European or at least Western democratic states protect religious freedom and manage the relationship with, between state and religion just to get a sense of how diverse these models are. So on the one hand, you have the French model, which is like this militant, secularist uh, system bent on keeping religion completely out of the public sphere. Then you have the American way, which is an agnostic, secular model that seeks to maintain a neutral stance among religions, but it doesn't shy away from favoring religion over atheism and uh, other, let's say, non-religious perspectives. Then you have a confessional secular model, which incorporates elements of the, let's say, the polity is mainstream majority religion, primarily for identitarian purposes and projects them as part of the polity's constitutional secular system rather than 
as linked to the country's main religion, which is the case of Italy or Spain, then you have a model with an official religion, now right? with institution, institutionalized tolerance for minority religions like the United Kingdom or some Scandinavian countries, etc. And then you have the millet-based system, like in which priority is given to collective self-government by each community within the polity, which is the case of Israel or the case of India to a certain extent. So this, of course, gives you an idea of how diverse and how complex of how diverse the relationship between state and church is in just in the world of Western democracy and how difficult it would be to try and uh, uh, come up with an agreed upon definition of how to best protect the religion and religious minorities, especially because none of the models that I just mentioned is ideal. And it is not ideal because uh, in Western countries, the secularization has implied a process of separation between the state and Christian churches, which means that it has naturally entailed the accommodation of the majority's Christian religion. So religious tolerance has really been kept uh, in a bent at keeping religious diversity within the private sphere. And in a globalized world, this system doesn't work. We have to learn to integrate religion for which the public versus private divide is not the same. The other problematic element that I see here is that uh, in the West, we've been, uh, we have built a strictly individual understanding of religious freedom, which makes it difficult to, to accommodate uh, religions uh, that place their emphasis more on the community rather than on the individual. Many say that the understanding of religious freedom in Western constitutions, in the European Convention of Human Rights, is really a Protestant understanding of religion. Um, finally, the last uh, challenge that I see to accommodating religious minorities is the, um, uh, let's say, the very worrisome phenomenon of religious nationalism and religious populism that pose a fundamental threat to accommodating pluralism. We can see the effects uh, of uh, uh, using religion as a proxy to uh, national identity in many parts of the world, from uh, right-wing evangelicals in the US to the partnership of politics and orthodoxy in Russia to what goes on in Hungary and Poland, you know, where majority religions are increasingly used politically as proxies for isolationism, anti-immigration positions, misogynous positions, etc., etc., so my conclusion is that I would be um, fascinated by uh, the, you know, by a project that really seeked at the international level to try and strike a balance between all these difficulties, precisely to react to these challenges. But I think that it is almost mission impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Kitanovic. I don't know if you have remarks to to. To make to 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 the comments of the of Professor Mancini before I give the floor to to the next speaker. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Professor Mancini. I mean, uh, this was uh, I, I agree with uh, everything what you have been pointed out, but uh, yeah, I I would be um, I think uh, optimistic that maybe in the future uh, we could when there is more consensus on the issue of solidarity. Uh, how uh, churches and religious communities should be treated by state, that uh, maybe uh, this uh, solidarity among churches, you know, like, and religious communities uh, and philosophical and non-confessional organizations uh, at the end, standing together could maybe help uh, in having, uh, let's say, more rights-based approach in treating, uh, uh, let's say, religious disputes or violation of freedom of religion or belief, not only in a sense of margin of appreciation, and uh, but in a sense uh, really bringing more equality. Um, I hear you, and you know, like being uh, based here in Brussels, uh, we know from the Lisbon Treaty that Article 17 actually says exactly what you have been saying. Uh, that there is margin of appreciation, and that means that uh, European Union is uh, not uh, having a competence on the issue of church-state relations or religion-state relations. 
So, and coming back, I really like your comment, uh, and I will pick up this for our human rights working group at the Conference of European Churches, uh, saying that, um, or referring that uh, the current understanding uh, about religious uh, freedom and the way European Human Rights Court uh, is uh, taking its decision also comes from the very Protestant understanding of freedom of religion or belief. Uh, as Conference of European Churches, we are uh, uh, Orthodox and uh, Protestant, Old Catholic uh, and Anglican, let's say, fellowship of churches. Mm -hmm. And I could see that minority churches, actually, they have been a major inspiration for advocating on freedom of religion or belief. Very well, for years, as Conference of European Churches, we have been documented, really through various publications, the cases that where the churches were really fighting for the same recognition, for the same right as majority, let's say, religion or churches uh, in certain European states. So, I, yes, I totally agree with you. It is long-standing debate, but maybe until our life, lifetime, we move things forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kitanovic. I guess that uh, as an expert in the Balkans, you also have some remarks about the idea of religious populism and the use of national identity uh, manipulating religion in, in certain contexts. But uh, now I will give the floor to the next, spe next speaker, our friend, Dr. Abdi Zenebe. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. It is quite an interesting discussion. And there are a lot already being achieved. I think there is also a similar debate. This issue is equally difficult at a national level as well as at the global level. And uh, across Africa also, there are a number of movements to ignite such a unified stand uh, to secure uh, religious rights, like using the golden rules and other things have been uh, to debate. And I think this is a very growing discussion, but uh, very important. And I don't know how it's going to fit with the Professor Susanna's idea of universally developing some things and her thorough explanation on a relativist line across different religions and geographical locations. So maybe this will be also one other thing we can discuss. But in general, when we come to uh, the second inquiry, especially uh, I would like to connect this issue with our experience, with the Ethiopian experience. Ethiopia, as you know, is undergoing a major reform process and uh, uh, the role of religion has been quite significant. Uh, we happen to experience high level of uh, ethnic polarization. Ethnicity has been a very important uh, political uh, 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 issue these days. In this regard, religion has played a very crucial role of creating a cross-cutting cleavage across different groups. And it played a very important role in bringing people across different divides, language and ethnic divides. And as a result, we have been taking the aspect of religion very seriously. At times, it happened to be one of the last retreat to uh, reconcile among different groups, because there are these ties uh, uh, brought by religion and belief system and other things. And one other things where we are observing in our part of the world is the uh, revival of different belief systems and religions, uh, which were you know, uh, in the past dominant, however, somehow uh, happened to be declining. But nowadays, with the growing democracy we are experiencing, we are witnessing the revival of different belief systems and other things away from you know, uh, widely known religions across the world. So I think protecting uh, uh, religious diversity and pluralism and the values captured in them is a guarantee to uh, enhance the state building process. Because whenever you uh, create a venue where religious rights are respected uh, in a mature manner, it serves a multiple purpose. They will not be easily manipulated and uh, uh, used for violence and other activities. So in these days, we are using religion as a very important uh, element in the state building process. This is why when we think of secularism, we have to consider our respective and peculiar cultural elements. Our own socio-political trajectory has to be taken into consideration. And through this, 
and religious values and belief systems are very crucial. This is why when we see does secularism mean exorcising, so to speak, a religion out of public realm, we say firmly no. As long as religion or religious, uh, the religious sphere is there, then the law should protect and guarantee uh, the protection of religious belief systems and pluralism in that regard. So a clear and bold separation of state and religion does not mean that law should not care less about religious citizens, minority or not, and their diverse values and belief systems, especially for a country moving very much away uh, from a leftist leaning ideology and thinking. This is very crucial for both minority and as well as uh, 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 large uh, majority religions in our country. On the other hand as well, if the threshold of democracy is respecting the people, you know, there are a lot of different definitions about democracy, but a bare minimum we can agree upon is it is about empowering the public. And when you have large number of people who are subscribed to religion, you have to ensure democracy. You have to ensure human rights. So respecting the religious values and belief system is very much connected to this very important issue. So then democracy cannot afford to ignore religious values, uh, beliefs that are cherished by the people. So respecting uh, the values uh, captured in religion are very much crucial for us. As such, the role of law is very, very important in ensuring the safety and the freedom of religious citizens. Now, at times we witness some uh, overlaps across religious divides and ethnic divides, and this has to be corrected through the uh, means of law. As it has been well observed by scholars in the field, secularism should not be confused with atheism, atheism, you know, the absence of religion or the like. So uh, in a democracy, one has to respect religious values and religious people, minority or otherwise. And this has been a very important part of the reform process Ethiopia has been undertaking. And uh, so the law should be equally protecting the religious and the non-religious citizens alike. This is what I would like to say, Ambassador. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. And it's a, a clear statement on, on how the, the legal framework should pay attention to the majorities as well as to the minorities in an equal, equal respectful uh, way for both and, and also for those who are non-believers. And that is a challenge in many areas of the world, I would say in all over the world for, for, for different reasons and with different uh, peculiarities. Now we are getting closer to the end of this panel, but we still have time to have a last uh, round of interventions. Uh, I have another question for you, but as we spoke before, we, um, this is a more wrap up uh, intervention for you. So I want you to feel free to have uh, an intervention where you can explain um, the, 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 the views in terms of recommendations, conclusions, or specific uh, questions that you want to leave on the table before you, you leave the session or we close the session. In the case of uh, Mr. Eppelman, I asked him before to say some words about the peculiar situation in, in Latin America. It's not that they don't share the same concerns and, and problems that we Europeans have in, in our own continent or, or, in, or elsewhere, but uh, certainly there are some peculiarities in, in Latin America. Maybe, Claudio, you can enlighten us uh, speaking or, or saying a couple of words about the, the, the situation there, and then please continue your intervention by uh, giving us some conclusions or, or some final remarks before we pass the floor to, to another speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am in Buenos Aires, uh, isolated at home since March 15. It means about seven months at home, which is creating a, which is a result of a sanitary crisis that is overlapped with an economic crisis, which is overlapped with the social crisis. So uh, in principle, we can say that we don't have good news from, uh, from my neighborhood, my, from my country. But I want to remark that we have something positive to, to share with, 
with all of you, but uh, particularly in this forum, that we don't have problems about interface coexistence, which is, I think, a value of these uh, of the Argentinian society, but also from the all, most of the Latin American countries. We don't have it. We have. Uh, I want to. I will put in a positive language. We have the best relationship between all the faiths living in this uh, in this region. And I want to share with you a, a story. Uh, seven years ago, I organized a trip to the, to the Holy Land. And I say we invited 15 Jews, 15 Christians, and 15 Muslims to visit Jerusalem, later to visit Ramallah, and from Ramallah to visit the Holy See to meet with the Pope. But in Jerusalem, we met the President of Israel, but, and also in Ramallah, we met the President of the Palestine. And uh, for most of the people, it was the first visit in uh, this region, in Middle East. The, we say, we use an expression, the hot potatoes. And uh, when we land, and we met first time in Jerusalem, uh, we had dinner all together. We came in different planes, not uh, everyone flew in the same uh, uh, flight. So the first gather was the first dinner we had in Jerusalem, and we, we finished the, the dinner in the presence of some uh, Israeli leaders from different religions, from some ambassadors. Uh, we have good news, but in Israel, as we say, uh, as we heard, uh, good news not all no good news about religions not always are reflected in the media. We said, uh, said uh, we have good news. We had dinner all together. We have been in the same room for a couple of long hours, eating and uh, chatting people, and we didn't kill each to other. It was as, as it was uh, presented as a joke. But I said in this region, it's a sensitive topic, but nobody understood the sensibility of the story uh, I shared, and the purpose of the trip was to learn about it and to pass a message in this region that coexistence between faiths is possible. And we, as a group, were sending this message to the Israeli, Palestinians, and also to the Holy Father who received us uh, in the Vatican, that Argentinian society is a proof that coexistence is possible. And what, what, what I want to remark uh, to, to also about it, that we believe that coexistence is not the result of the good willing. Coexistence is the result of the faith leaders. The step that they give forward in the right direction with a lot of courage. Because sometimes the decisions are very difficult. And we, we do, we did uh, a platform with we were working very close with Ambassador Alvaracete about it, uh, trying to put all the religions together in a declaration that we call the Declaration of Cordoba, because Cordoba is the city where it was signed. And also remind something uh, about Spain. Spain in the history where in Cordoba was based, the, the, it, it was a somehow also a city where coexistence between Muslim, Jews, and Christians was, uh, in some period, uh, a proof also of, of it. And we signed a declaration uh, in which we said that we declare Latin America and the Caribbean as an area of coexistence between faiths. It was all the declaration. It was a very short statement. But we have only one extra sentence. We have to keep it. We have to work. We have to do an effort to keep this coexistence. And this is what I believe the role of the religious leaders. Not only to achieve the coexistence, but once we did it, also to deeper, to, to keep it, and to work to produce it. And I think in this point, interreligious dialogue is a, is a resource that we have to develop, but because which is the meaning of interface dialogue and what I see in the uh, historical perspective. 
religions for a long, long time didn't speak each to other. And we have a, a very negative relationship between all of us. And only in the modern, in the last uh, the 20th century, we, we begin after it could be as a key point between Jews and Christ, uh, Catholics and later Christians. And uh, as a key point, the uh, Second Council, Vatican Council. And we discovered and we said, okay, let's speak. And we launched the dialogue because we didn't speak before it. We didn't interact each to other. So the dialogue in this uh, uh, historical perspective, I think, is a very short period in the in the relationship between the the faith leaders. And now we launch it, and now we have to work about it. And I only want to to, to summarize with another story that something that happened this year between the Muslim communities in the different countries in Latin America and the Jewish communities in some countries in Latin America. And I think around examples we can see, we, we can reflect this message. We invite all the Jewish communities to celebrate with the, our brothers from the Muslim communities from every country in uh, Latin America, Ramadan. And virtually, because uh, the, the sanitary conditions in, uh, in, in Latin America, we celebrate Ramadan. And later we celebrate the sacrifice fest the Eid al-Adha, to also together, the Jewish community celebrated together with the Muslim communities. As a result of it, my personal most, most moving uh, uh, celebration of the Jewish New Year, the Rosh Hashanah, was organized by the Muslim communities in Latin America, and they invite all the Jewish leaders in Latin America to celebrate all together the Jewish New Year. And I think in these kind of steps that we go, trying to do deeper our coexistence, we are passing a message that I would love to, to, to give as a testimony in this meeting in Saudi Arabia, to say coexistence between faiths is possible. And Latin America is a proof of it, because leaders are committed in the sense of the human fraternity. And human fraternity, it is not just a statement. Human fraternity is a, uh, is a way of interaction with the other. And I think, again, we are proving that it is possible. And this is my last message on behalf of all the Latin Americans leaders from several religions to, to leave it in Saudi Arabia in the Saudi Arabian Interface Forum. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Eppelman. I think that the experience of Argentina uh, is definitely something uh, worth uh, exporting, and we all uh, should acknowledge the important role that you are playing in, in, the, in the country, and not only the country, in the continent, by bringing together different faiths and um, and we want to, to thank you and to congratulate for the effort that you are doing in, in that important continent. Dr. Kitanovic, now the, the, the floor goes to, to you for your final remarks and considerations. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. I think it is uh, great uh, that uh, we have this opportunity to meet together from all over the world in the context of the G20 Interfaith Forum where even though there is a COVID pandemic, uh, we still can come together, which is fascinating, thanks to the di digital platforms. And uh, we still can uh, celebrate uh, religious feasts uh, together. As Claudia mentioned, in Latin America, we had similar initiative here in Brussels, where we also celebrated Ramadan together with uh, uh, Dialogue and Diversity group which was organized uh, by European Jewish Community Center uh, in Brussels and uh, we have got together and during also Easter uh, and Hanukkah and um, also Ramadan we have basically uh, we have a group of women who use this opportunity also to exchange good recipes how to cook very good food to celebrate uh, these feasts and that was fascinating learning experience 
how we got together in the pandemic. And also we have done something fantastic that normally we would not do, maybe do it uh, because we are all busy with traveling here and there and, and so on. So there are positive things that also during COVID pandemic actually uh, helped in bringing these communities and friendships closer to our heart. As for the question uh, of uh, majority and minority relation that uh, Dr. Abdi mentioned, I think this is one of the crucial questions that also for the next uh, G20 Interfaith Forum, we should put also on the agenda and have maybe a panel a discussion how this majority uh, minority relations are regulated also from the international legal point of view, but also on the re regional legal uh, hierarchy or legal systems uh, and etc. And of course, uh, using the example of the Euro European Union and Lisbon Treaty of the Article 17, uh, I find it also fascinating that here in Brussels, churches and religious communities, philosophical and non-confessional organizations are invited for open, transparent and regular dialogue with European institutions to contribute to various sectoral policies of the European Union on the various uh, matters. So I am very pleased that we had this opportunity to, to exchange, to listen from various continents uh, this uh, evening. And uh, I hope we will continue also these discussions about possibilities, whether we could have this maybe UN Convention of Religious Freedom or not. And uh, I would just conclude uh, with a good remark from a good friend who said that today's ideals are tomorrow's realities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kitanovic. Thank you for sharing with, your, with us your experiences, but also your, your knowledge. You know that we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Dr. Mancini. Please. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and thank you to all of you um, for these wonderful stories. Unfortunately, as a you know, as a, sadly, as an academic, I don't have these uh, wonderful stories uh, to, to, to share with you as I don't work in the field. But um, uh, so the pandemic hasn't brought anything new or happy to this conversation. I, the, the, uh, I think the, um, the, um, the problem I would like to point to in my closing remarks is... Uh, also has to do with uh, the uh, relationship between majorities and minorities that Dr. Abdi pointed to, and it is such an important point. Uh, th this is a, a, an issue that really boils down to the overall problem of what is the role of religion in politics. Um, we have learned that uh, religion are not happy with the privatization. Uh, long ago, they began to challenge the public-private divide, etc., so uh, the problem is, however, how much deprivatized religion um, is uh, uh, is capable of uh, keeping with pluralism in a in a, in a democratic society, and uh, uh, the problem with minority and majorities protection is that majorities already have a very important key instrument, which is the instrument of the law, in order to. Uh, let's say, in order to go forward with their agenda, in order to, um, you know, to articulate what are their needs, uh, what, uh, what, what, they, uh, what they want to achieve. On the other hand, minorities uh, that are not, especially very, mar you know, typically marginalized minorities that are not, do, do not have a voice in decision-making processes, must count on the law in a much more robust way. They have to count on courts. They have to count on international bodies that come and act when in order let's say to um to um neutralize the uh, potentially tyranny tyranny of majorities so this is i think the emphasis uh, that we should uh, uh, where we should put our emphasis um you know it is there. There has to be a need uh, to put a stop to certain religious claims, uh, especially that come from um, uh, majoritarian religions that are increasingly politicized in many democratic systems. Uh, 
you know, so the other day um, I heard, uh, I read an opinion by two judges, uh, the sitting judges in the American Supreme Court, uh, writing down that the decision where the court constitutionalized the same-sex marriage was wrongly decided because it offends religious freedom. It offends the religious freedom of those people who oppose gay rights. Well, religious freedom cannot translate into the right not to be offended. It cannot translate into the right to discriminate against traditionally marginalized minorities of all kinds, religious minorities, sexual minorities, etc., etc., especially because traditional mainstream religion is often implicated in the marginalization of minorities. So um, I think that what I would really um, very much welcome would be an in-depth uh, conversation concerning um, how to best uh, protect religious freedom in a pluralistic society is taking into account all these different dimensions. The over-politicization of uh, especially very conservative streams of uh, majority religions, the need to protect the minorities in an increasingly globalized world, and uh, this uh, extremely important thing, which is to keep all the voices uh, that uh, should be part of the conversation alive, trying to keep, in, you know, to keep the conversation as inclusive as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amantini. I think your intervention has been very interesting, and, and uh, you have referred to the protection of freedom of religion in pluralistic societies. We in Kaisit, we have a big program dealing with what we call common citizenship, trying not to differentiate uh, people according to the different religious affiliation, and that is a program being implemented in different areas of the world, but mainly in the Middle East, considering that maybe the minority, there are certain minorities who feel that their rights are not respected, and the, the way that we have found in a, um, let's say, in an efficient, uh, efficient way to, to defend the rights of those uh, persons is to defend the, 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 the right for them to be considered as common citizens in, in, in their own country, regardless the religious or the ethnic or whatever uh, affiliation can differentiate them and assign to, to minorities. Um, the last uh, speaker is our friend from Ethiopia, Dr. Abdi Zinebe. The floor again is yours. Thank you, uh, and I really appreciate. I want to uh, bring about two issues which are very important, uh, I believe, uh, not only in Africa, but in the rest part of the world. One is already indicated by um, our esteemed colleague from Latin America, that the interface dialogues, dialogues are very much crucial instruments uh, in ensuring both the rights of the minorities uh, as well as uh, creating cohesion at the state level. Uh, and this is uh, uh, also need to be uh, linked to the important issue of uh, making institutions, uh, religious institutions especially, uh, uh, capable of practicing democratic, administrative, and institutional uh, values, uh, corruption and institutional failures within uh, religions is a major uh, problem uh, and it uh, challenges the credibility of such institutions. Uh, institutions that seem to capture and the custodians of the ethos of a society need to be very uh, much uh, clean in, 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 in not only preaching and communicating these noble values, but in practicing these values is always very crucial because these institutions, as I said, when the going get tougher, we happen to rely heavily on these issues and are, because religion and religious institutions communicate to the depths of human uh, soul and you know, create fraternity uh, and solidarity among humanity. So I think uh, uh, overall, the, this bodies, because you know, our institution, the Ministry of Peace is responsible in overseeing religious institutions. We know, we, 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 as a secular state, we have no right to uh, interfere in the creed and belief systems and other elements of these institutions, but we are uh, expected to look into corruption, administrative uh, malpractices, and also 
internal conflicts within uh, these institutions. And this has been also a major challenge, creating stability at an interface level and at the intra-religious level and inter-religious level is very crucial uh, uh, in many regards. So in this, I would like to wrap up my uh, reflections and I'm very happy to be invited here and congratulations for the organizers and I'm very, very happy to meet I think there is a problem with the last words of the of the speaker from Ethiopia. Kifor, can you help us yes, with this? Yes, or? unfortunately, uh, we uh, we lost Abdi. I'm, I'm back. Okay, actually. he's back. Great. <laughs> please, please Abdi. resume resume your your last words, uh, doctor. You know, you didn't heard any any of the words I said earlier. No, 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 we heard almost everything you were saying that you were wrapping up. Uh, okay, I, I would like to say that thank you for inviting me on behalf of the Ministry of Peace and the government of Ethiopia. I'm very, very glad. And I really enjoyed this dialogue and the discussion. I think we also hope for this uh, inspiring suggestions made by the panelists, and we will support this initiative of having to have uh, protective uh, the, the, uh, global level protective laws for religious rights and uh, faith related issues and i thank you all for inviting me I appreciate it thank you. so thank you professor that that is the last intervention today and with your intervention we close the session and the panel dealing with rule of law religious rights and human rights i found it very fascinating and I thank you, all of you, for your interventions. I th also thank you, the audience. I cannot see you, but I guess that you are at the other side of the screen. It's not for me to wrap up now the intervention of all the speakers, but we have a person who has taken notes of all the interventions, and that person will summarize the different uh, remarks and also will extract the conclusions and the, and the recommendations, and everything will be collected in a document for all the panels and the plenaries uh, of these days of uh, conference of the G20 Interfaith Forum. Said so that, I want to thank you again for being there uh, with us and again our friends, the, the panelists, the participants, thank you again for your intervention. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Thank you to bye. our thank organizers you. and also, and thank you for KICID for helping us to running a lot of activities in Latin America. Thank you, Ambassador Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. From bye bye. Goodbye, nice to meet you all, bye bye. Thank you.